May you never end up in an icy Scottish prison. But if you do, may you be there with Murta. Because Murta! Hi, and welcome to Sex and Whiskey. I'm story expert Lonnie Diane Rich of Chipperish Media, and we're here today to talk about All Debts Paid, the third episode of season three. All Debts Paid aired on September 24th, 2017, and was written by Matthew B. Roberts. This episode was directed by Brendan Mayer. This is the second of four episodes Mayer will direct this season. Y'all, I tried. I tried to see Frank as a tormented guy who was just doing his best. I tried. But prepare yourselves. There will be ranting, because Frank is an asshole. But hey, at least we get us some lovely Lord John Gray to balance that out, right? All right, let's go through the stones. Prisoners treat him as their chief. They call him McDo. In All Debts Paid, Jamie's life in prison gets complicated when John William Gray, the 16-year-old kid who tried to kill Jamie before Preston Pans, becomes the warden of Ardsmuir. The relationship evolves into a true friendship, and then Gray falls in love with Jamie because Jamie apparently inherited the everybody loves me gene from his mother, Ellen. Oh, Ellen McKenzie. Meanwhile, in Boston, Frank is whiny, selfish, and self-absorbed as he bitches through 18 years of marriage to Claire, finally asking for a divorce right before getting killed in a car accident, proving that even the fates have had enough of his bullshit. And now Frank isn't there anymore. Once again, we have a fantastic, almost perfectly executed story on Jamie's side of things. So let's start there. We start with Lord John Gray being led through Ardsmuir Prison for his training day with the old British fart he's replacing. And we nicely get in a bit of exposition about the value of the French gold. The man that does deliver a treasure such as that to London would certainly have the attention of the crowd. There is the implication that the only officers who get sent to Ardsmuir are there as a punishment, and I love how subtle the writing is here. Why is Lord John being punished? What did he do? Well, we can guess. He's gay, and his banishment is likely related to that. But I love the way the writers don't make a big deal out of explaining it all. In this instance, they're trusting their audience, and I think it's an excellent example of how that is done. And here we move into what I call the Gabaldonian coincidence machine. Not to spoil anything for the folks who haven't read the books yet, but you're going to want to make your peace with this thing. As Lord John Gray sees Jamie for the first time, and Gray immediately recognizes the notorious Scottish soldier. I mean, what are the chances, right? And while we're watching Lord John Gray watching Jamie, I can't help but notice the two guys standing next to Jamie doing their peas and carrots background extra chit-chat. They don't look nearly rough enough to have spent years in a Scottish prison after barely surviving the most horrific slaughter in the history of their country. They look like they stepped out of an Abercrombie and Fitch ad. Someone slathered a bit of mud on their faces and said, Grayson, Ascot, you're up. Later, we catch up with Jamie in prison, part of the community and yet separate from it because he's a leader and leadership of a group always keeps you separate from that group. But then we change our angle and see that Murtaugh is right beside him, making sure he's never alone. Murta! I mean, he's obviously not well, and that's a little scary, but Murta! One of the things I've always loved about Outlander is the way the masculine relationships are built on community. This isn't something you see in a lot of modern stories. Women form communities, and men tend to separate themselves. They don't talk about their emotions, they don't show love and caring for each other, and if they do, they follow it up with some kind of gay panic, which is usually played off for a joke. But in Outlander, the love and caring and respect between men is beautiful and unquestioned and never takes away from their masculinity. And it's in this environment that we introduce Lord John Gray and one of the most complicated and textured masculine relationships I've yet seen. First, Gray brings Jamie into his chambers to talk, two leaders who are separated from their communities coming together and slowly understanding each other. And we hit once again, subtly, on Gray's status as an exile. God knows what you did to be sent here. But for your own sake, I hope you deserve that. Gray obviously remembers and still resents Jamie, but he doesn't use his power to punish Jamie. He's an honorable man, and we see that in him when he pulls Jamie in to translate for him to find out from a dying Scotsman about the French gold, which could be Gray's ticket out of Ardsmuir and back into the good graces of the crown. 
It is during this sequence, as they negotiate the terms of Jamie's service as an interpreter, that we see the respect between the two men. Gray has Jamie's chains removed, and when Jamie asks for blankets and medicine for the sick men, we see Gray's honor and compassion in his response. Mr. Fraser, believe me when I tell you that I would honor your request if I were able. This is the moment when these two start to respect and maybe even like each other. Two leaders of men who understand each other in perhaps a way no one else there can understand either one of them. I believe the invitation to dinner is as much about Gray's need to connect as it is about trying to get more information about the French gold from Jamie. Mr. Fraser, I only ask for you to dine with me and attempt to forge a connection between us better suited to our situation here. And yes, it's pretty clear that Gray's falling in love with Jamie, which he obviously is, because everyone falls in love with Jamie the way everyone fell in love with his mother, Ellen. It's just a matter of time before one of the British soldiers carves Jamie a pair of hideous boar tusk bracelets, mark my word. It's not just about the French gold or the escape of a notorious prisoner that upsets Gray when Jamie runs off. And it's not the romantic feelings that he has for Jamie either. Jamie is his friend, and the betrayal of a friend is hard to take. But Jamie returns, and this is where we have one clunky scene in this part of the story. First of all, he hides out, waiting for Gray, I guess, to take a piss, and then grabs him by the throat, reminding him of who he is and asking Gray to kill him. Why? We didn't see his experience looking for Claire, the disappointment he must have felt, and we don't see the aftermath of that experience here. There's nothing in his demeanor that shows devastation or the wish for death or giving up. But he reminds Gray of who he is, hands the sword over, and sets himself down to be killed. Gray doesn't do it, of course. I am not a murderer of unarmed prisoners. And I think Jamie would know Gray well enough to know this. So what is this theatrical display about? Is it just so they have a platform for the completely unnecessary flashbacks? And while we're on this topic, let me address this quickly. There was a time before DVD box sets and definitely before streaming when we needed flashbacks to be reminded of material we had no way to revisit. That kind of thing isn't necessary anymore. Put the clips in the previously on segment at the front of the episode and stop doing flashbacks, TV writers. Trust your audience. You know, the way you just did with John Gray's Exile? Like that. Jamie shows his trust for Gray by telling him about Claire and then giving him the gem he found while he was out searching for her. In this moment, he shares the thought that might have made sense to the whole wanting to die thing if the statement was delivered with devastation and heartbreak rather than simply sad acceptance. She's truly gone. Gray rewards Jamie's confidence and trust by sending a doctor to tend to Murtaugh, and the friendship evolves until we get to one night over chess when both men share their stories of loss, and Gray lets his feelings get the best of him. Take your hand off me. I will kill you. And here's the thing. I know I stated earlier that Outlander does excellent male relationships without the gay panic, but I don't believe that this is gay panic. This is trauma. It's not about the fact that Grey is gay. It's about the fact that Grey has power over him, the way that Jack Randall had power over him. It's the power differential, not the gayness, that Jamie's reacting to here. And he's right. When you have that kind of power over someone else, a relationship isn't an option. Your particular position on the Kinsey scale has absolutely nothing to do with it. But when Gray uses his power for Jamie, he does it to secure a new life. As the rest of the prisoners are carted off to indentured servitude in the colonies, Gray takes Jamie to live a new life in a new place where he may not be exactly free, but he won't be in prison either. You gave him my life all those years ago. Now I give you yours. I hope you use it well. Your brother discharged that debt for the sake of the family name. I discharged it for the sake of my own. And we end a beautifully written chapter with Jamie moving on to start a new life once again. Here we go again. Claire goes to medical school, gets a best friend, becomes a doctor, celebrates her daughter's milestones, and what has happened with her story? Again? Hijacked by Frank Randall and his petulant bullshit. 
Look, I hate Frank, and even I'm getting bored of the hating Frank rants. But of all the terrible Frank we've gotten so far, we get the worst of him this week. All right, let's do this thing. Last week, I said Frank had a right to say that what Claire could give him wasn't enough for him, and he did have that right. And his right was to then choose to leave. If what someone is giving you isn't enough for you, your right is to leave the relationship. Not to stay and demand they give you something they don't have, then make them miserable and guilty every minute of every day. Not to make everything about you and use every situation, every circumstance, every person in your life, even and especially your daughter, as a tool to punish them. See, here's Frank making breakfast. Seems like a nice thing, right? Except it's not about doing something nice for his wife and child. It's about making Bree more English because he can't stand for anything to not be about him. And when Claire reaches out to him and suggests they go to a movie together, he says he's already seen the movie, specifically to drop the hint that it was with his mistress. And then he makes it Claire's fault by saying... We agreed we were free to... No, of course. I'm, I'm being discreet, Claire. Yes, you are. Thank you. Yeah, she said that because you were being petulant and whiny, Frank, and you wouldn't leave. Because you didn't get things the way that you wanted, stated that the situation wasn't enough for you, and then refused to leave. What was she supposed to do? And you know what, Frank? You can go see the same movie twice. People do it all the time. The story that watching the same movie twice makes your penis fall off is an urban myth. I mean, I know they didn't have Snopes.com in the 60s, but you're an educated man, Randall. Figure it out. Then, when Claire graduates from medical school, he sets it up so that his date stomps right into the middle of the party, humiliating both her and Claire. Because he couldn't let anything be about Claire, even for one damn day. Then, when Frank comes home drunk, we get so close to what I wanted for him. That he was hurt. That he genuinely tried. That he loved Claire so much that he would take what she could give him and be grateful, even though it cut through him. I wanted to see a Frank who was genuinely trying, who loved her and was patiently waiting for her to love him back, and the hurt from that drove him sadly away, and I wanted that to be part of Claire's story, not all about Frank. But that's not what we got. What we get here is petulant, pissy Frank punishing Claire by spoiling Brie and making Claire play bad cop all the time. Punishing Claire by humiliating her in front of her friends and colleagues. Punishing Claire by refusing to give her a divorce, not because it would hurt Brie, but because how can he use the kid to hurt Claire every day if he only sees her on weekends? I mean, he can do it. It's a time-honored tradition for divorced parents the world over. It's just not convenient. Once again, he makes it all Claire's fault. Do you honestly think anyone at Harvard believes that we're happily married? You know what, Frank? It's not her fucking job to convince your stupid Harvard cronies that your marriage is happy. And if you cared what they thought, maybe not carrying on an affair with one of the PhD students at Harvard would help your case a little bit. Fast forward a few years. Bree graduates high school and is technically an adult, and Frank finally asks Claire for a divorce. And what's his plan? To take Bree away from Claire. Not because he loves his daughter, and it would be an amazing experience for her to go to school in England, but because Brie is Claire's last connection to Jamie, and this way, he can really twist that knife. And you know what? Now's a good time to step back from all of this for a minute, Frank. Yes, Claire loved Jamie, and she lost Jamie, and she mourned him. She didn't get over it the moment you snapped your fingers, because that's not how grief works, you idiot. But you chose to stay with her. You chose to raise Brie. And you chose to punish Claire for your choices every opportunity you got. So maybe, just maybe, it wasn't because of Jamie that she couldn't love you, Frank. Maybe it was because you're an asshole, Frank. Maybe if you had treated her with the kind of love you demanded from her and tried to help and support her. Maybe if you'd given her time and space to process her grief. Maybe she would have loved you. Or maybe not. Might you have forgotten him? With time. That amount of time doesn't exist. But if you had done that, if you had been genuinely loving and patient and were just sad that she couldn't love you back, if you hadn't deliberately lashed out to make her miserable at every turn, to punish her for something that was not under her control, maybe you could have been just a sad man and not a raging asshole. 
When Frank finally dies in that car accident and Claire cries over his body, all I can think is, so help me God, if they bring him back as a ghost to hijack her story next week, I'm going to need a lot more scotch. And now with a sigh of relief, it's Claire's turn to walk off into a new life without 180 pounds of pissy, petulant dead weight making her story all about him. One of the things I love about Jamie, and especially these 20 years in his life, is how with every new chapter, he assumes a new identity and a new name. Last week, he was the Dunbonnet, the mythical war hero living in a cave to be close to his family's lands while eluding the British, who were constantly on the hunt for him. This week, he's McDo, the chieftain of imprisoned men, bringing them together in a hodgepodge clan, providing leadership and the comfort of a lost way of life. As far as I can tell from my research on the internet, which is always right about everything, except that urban myth that seeing one movie twice will make your penis fall off, MacDo means son of the black one, referencing either Brian's black hair or the devil. I'm guessing it's Brian's black hair. All over the Highlands, the clan way of life has been forcefully eradicated, taking with it the identities of people who lived in those clans, forcing them to build a new way of life that disconnects them from their past. But here, in Ardsmuir, the men are able to retain some of that tradition, all because they adopted a chieftain and named him for his history, for the lost father that gave him his identity. Finally, at the end of the story, when Lord John Gray takes him to his new home in the English countryside, we see Jamie transition out of Macdu, the chieftain with no clan to lead anymore, and move into yet another identity. If you would consider a piece of well-meant advice, it might be judicious not to use a name as easily recognized as your own. And while we're on the topic, we also get a lovely three-beat with Jamie nodding to the power of names. First, when he talks with Murtaugh, cobbling together a salve for the rat bites that plague his clansmen, he speaks of Claire, but refuses to say her name. I learned the trick from... Alas. The new... Fair amount about healing. The second beat comes later when Jamie tells Murtaugh about Duncan Kerr's White Witch. Murtaugh doesn't say Claire's name either. I wish we could know what became of her once you sent her through the storms. I'm wishing I'll not bring her back. But I think of her every now and then. And we burn that she was carrying. But then finally, when he's playing chess with Lord John, Jamie is able to speak of her. He gives the power of Claire's name to his new friend. Claire. Her name was Claire. And then John goes and screws it all up, but he, like so many men and women before him, are helpless to be in Jamie's presence without falling in love with him. Hey. Guy's only human. He should just be glad he never met Oh, Ellen McKenzie. Last week's question was about rabbits and birds, and I didn't get quite as many responses as I got from the Frank question. Everyone has opinions about Frank. But I got a couple of responses, and I find it really interesting. We get another dead rabbit and another dead bird in the pheasant that they eat for dinner in this episode. And I'm pretty sure I'm looking for meaning where there is none. But Katie, Sarah, and Kelly have some thoughts for us. Hi, Lani. Katie from Austin, Texas here. Um, in folklore, I think of Br'er Rabbit. I think of the rabbit and the hare. Rabbits are often known for being uh, fast and quick-witted, but also kind of arrogant, uh, which kind of reflects Fergus a little bit. So I think that the dead rabbit in the trap was kind of foreshadowing for what was about to happen to Fergus, although it wasn't quite that extreme. Hi, Lani. This is Sarah. I have my after work drink about the bunny i think that one's actually pretty simple it seems in a lot of cultures bunnies mean fertility for obvious reasons and life resurrection easter so here we have a field of carnage and in the midst of death we have life despite jamie's best intentions it's a moment in which he's about to die and the bunny comes along and says no there's life left i don't think it has to be more than that although we'll see what they do i thought we should talk about rabbits and birds so birds, I think you covered that like really well and 100% that 
birds have a lot to do with Claire, Claire's state, whether physical or emotional. On what is now the UK continent, uh, rabbits were um, associated with the god, uh, goddess actually, Esther. She was associated with rabbits and, you know, it's no coincidence that rabbits and Easter are kind of linked now. Esther, the goddess, she would often change into a rabbit and many women were thought to change into rabbits um, as well. And so I was thinking perhaps that that is what's going on in Jamie's mind. Now, these videos are much longer than I have time to include in the show, and I sadly had to edit out a lot of brilliance just for time considerations. So if you ever send in a video to Sex and Whiskey and are not too shy, you should share them on social media and let me know so I can retweet because they're brilliant. I loved the association with the rabbit and Easter and resurrection. That was a fantastic observation. And I know that Ronald D. Moore said it was just a rabbit, but whatever, death of the author. I also love the idea of associating the rabbit as a shapeshifter and a trickster, and connecting the rabbit both with Fergus and with Claire. We had another dead rabbit this week, on the moor when the prisoners were making the distraction so that Jamie could escape, and this dead rabbit makes the connection to the resurrection of Jamie's freedom. We also have Bree's stuffed rabbit, and Bree is how Jamie lives on in Claire, so that's a little more resurrection. Sadly, I don't think any of this is deliberate within the text because it's not drawn out with a sense of purpose, but man, I like it. And I will never not think of all of this whenever we see rabbits in Outlander. And now we're on to this week's question. We introduce Lord John Gray in this episode, and I love this character. I always have. I'm interested to hear what you guys think. How do you like Lord John Gray? You can visit chipperish.com and look in the Sex and Whiskey category to find instructions on how to send your videos and where to send them. All right, that'll do it for today. This episode of Sex and Whiskey was brought to you by Sarah from San Francisco, who supports Chipperish Media at the power producer level, and as a reward, gets to produce whatever show she wants. I just hope she really hates Frank or she might not like the episode that I gave her. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to everyone who supports Chipperish Media and makes all of this possible. Visit patreon.com slash chipperish to find out how you too can become a sex and whiskey producer. I'll see you next time with my thoughts on season three, episode four of Lost Things. Slange Sex and Whiskey is a Chipperish Media production and is entirely funded by passionate story lovers like you. Visit patreon.com slash chipperish to find out how you can become a Chipperish Media supporter.